I got a signal. Uh, welcome to the Warren Lecture Series. I am very happy to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Branko Dominic. Uh, it's very happy occasion because Branko is a member of civil engineering family, our department family. He was a student here of Professor Charles Furhurst uh, many years ago. Uh, uh, he, 30 years ago to be exact, he came from Belgrade uh, where he got a bachelor degree in civil engineering, then he did his master's and PhD here, and right away he joined Aitaska company, and he has been there ever since. So Branko is a rock mechanics guy, so his expertise is uh, in uh, stability of underground uh, excavations for the purpose of uh, storing oil and nuclear waste. He was involved in Yucca Mountain project for 10 years, and now he is uh, leading efforts uh, on numerical, with uh, numerical uh, tools uh, to, to be more exact. Uh, uh, fun, for fundamental study of enhanced, enhanced geothermal system, which is funded by U.S. Department of Energy. And with that, please welcome as a member of our team, Dr. Dominic. Uh, thank you, Sonia, for introduction. And I'd like to thank, thank Emmanuel for inviting me to give uh, this uh, presentation. Um, yeah, I can't believe that it's more than 20 years since I spoke last time here at the department uh, seminar. Uh, but in any case, it feels good to be back here again. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, lattice model for simulation of uh, hydraulic fracturing or more generally treatment of rock masses or reservoir by fluid uh, injection and I'll specifically talk a little bit more about optimization of such models. Uh, I want to make, uh, to say that the results that I'm going to present are, uh, uh, include contribution from a number of members of Itasca team. And I'd like to point out Maria Torres, who is kind of chief programmer in charge of uh, the, the code that I'm going to describe. Uh, Christine de Tournay, who worked on a number of important functionalities in the code, and of course I cannot skip mentioning uh, Peter Kandel, uh, because the formation of the code is based on some of his uh, initial original uh, ideas. So I have a couple of uh, slides as uh, as introduction and provide the motivation for the work that I'm going to uh, present. So the treatment of the rock mass by fluid injection is used uh, these days by a number of different industries, including uh, petroleum, where it's usually referred as hydraulic fracturing. Then for development of uh, enhanced geothermal uh, reservoirs. Mining is using uh, uh, injection of the fluid in the rock mass is to precondition rock mass more and more uh, to make uh, rock mass more capable in block caving operations to control the fragmentation of the rock mass and also very often is used to basically control the uh, uh, hazard due to uh, mining induced uh, seismicity and uh, Mark Board has done kind of pioneering work in late 80s and 90s in that area in South African, deep South African mines. In addition, uh, treatment of rock mass by fluid injection is also used in radio, for radio waste storage, uh, CO2 sequestration, and so on. However, this process is still more an art uh, than uh, science or engineering. And I'll elaborate on two more cases to illustrate uh, that. <coughs> First, we are all witnesses of what is called uh, shale uh, revolution. And the slide on the right is a cartoon showing uh, on the right side typical wells that were used for conventional reservoir where you would create hydraulic fracture from the vertical well. 
The shale gas revolution was made possible by advances in few different technologies. One is directional drilling, which allows us to create a horizontal segments of the well bore, sometimes up to a couple of kilometers long. And by doing so, we have access to much greater volume of the, of the reservoir. In addition, industry is using what is called multi-stage stimulation or multi-stage hydraulic fracturing. When then we create the hydraulic fractures along the horizontal of the well of the well bore, from the toe to the heel, and that multi-stage uh, stimulation are, allow us to do homogeneous uh, uh, stimulation of the of the of the rock mass. And third development that allowed uh, this shale gas revolution is developments in the uh, field of rheology of the fluids, basically use of uh, slick, slick water. On the left side is kind of outdated uh, plot of United States with in indication of different shale gas plays. Everything actually started here, which is Burnett. Uh, uh, formation. However, operators working in Marcellus very s quickly realized that whatever worked well in Marnet shale, it doesn't work in, in uh, Mar Marcellus. Now, m most striking fact about extraction of the oil and shale and, uh, and gas from shale formation is that between 80 and 95 percent of reserve is not in instructed. And the data from recent infill wells from industry that indicates that those wells, where basically what industry is doing is, is basically drilling new wells in the vicinity of the existing well with attempt to e extract remaining reserve. The information is showing that actually those wells fall way below uh, expectations. So that means that that re left reserve there is not only not is extracted, but probably unextractable. So this is clearly very uh, unsatisfactory. Here is the another couple of few pictures of United States, uh, which are showing the the contours of the temperature at different depths. Uh, 2.5 kilometers, 6.5, and 10. You probably can't see the color scale, but the purple one is 350 degrees C, and the yellow one is 200 degrees. So Jeff Tester wrote a report in 2006 in which he basically did some study, and he claims that the geothermal energy stored in a, at accessible depths. I, 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 I'm not sure, I don't have a good feeling what 13 million quads means, but I can understand what means uh, 130,000 times the current annual consumption of pr uh, primary energy. The problem is we still don't know how to extract this thermal energy from the formations which have low porosity uh, and low permeability. There were a number of field experiments done, starting with Fenton Hills, United States in, in the 70s by Los Alamos. And there were work by in, in Europe at Salts, in uh, Australia at the Cooper Basin. And all of those field experiments fell short of the target for economically viable production of energy from these geothermal uh, uh, formations, and that would be five megawatts of equivalent ec uh, electrical energy. That criteria of five megawatt of equivalent uh, electrical energy can be also expressed in uh, two other uh, conditions. One is, can we percolate the water at seven to 80 kilograms per second at reasonable pressures? And the second one would be, if we achieve that, can, we, can the produce water temperature have a lower uh, temperature drop than two degrees per, per year. Unfortunately, those two criteria are working against each other, meaning that if we achieve sufficient permeability to achieve the flux of 80 kilograms per second, the temperature drop is often very 
much sharper, meaning that usually the permeability is achieved by stimulating single fracture, single fracture, and then consequently the temperature of the produced water cools down real quick. In effect, what the geothermal energy achieves is more or less the same as what uh, petroleum energy or industry achieves. The difference is that the value of the produced resource, the value of the bucket of oil costs way more than the bucket of the, of the hot water. So in my opinion, one of the things that uh, these industries are missing in order to achieve rational design of uh, operations, of the treatment of the reservoirs by fluid injection is analytical tool which is uh, representing all relevant uh, physical processes. Rock deformation and fracturing, transport of fluid, transport of heat, and in the same time And in the same time, can represent rheological geology of the of the fractured reservoir, meaning represent the rock mass as heterogeneous and isotropic, and at a certain scale, explicitly represent discontinuities and or discretions of the rock mass. The reason is, as it's illustrated in some of these photographs, which are taken by in my by experiment by Norm Warpinski, the pre-existing discontinuities, heterogeneities, have profound effect on, on a fracture propagation. In addition, when we, when we treat rock mass by fluid injection, objective is not only to create the hydraulic fractures, very often objective is also to stimulate these uh, pre-existing uh, uh, discontinuities. So Itatska has been developing different models for simulation of the formation and the failure of the, of the rock masses for years. Over the past 15 <coughs> years, we have been developing what is called synthetic rock mass, or, or SRM. And SRM actually has uh, two components. One component is what we call bonded particle model, which is way to represent the formation and the fracturing of the brittle rocks. And the other component is representation of the pre-existing joints or discontinuities. And we call that a uh, smooth joint model. Smooth joint model is one of these very clever Peter's ideas where if you use a bonded particle model, a uh, straightforward way to represent discontinuity would be to basically weaken or break bones between particles inter intersected by that discontinuity. However, discontinuity that we would create in that way in our model would have some roughness. And that is okay because we know that roughness have profound effect on both deformation, deformational and strength properties of a joint. The problem is that that roughness is artifact of the model. It is related to a discretization that we are using in this particular model. So the smooth joint model kind of resolves this problem by reorienting the contacts which are intersected by discontinuity perpendicular to discontinuity instead of connecting the particles that are related to that contact. By doing so, the joints can smoothly slip relative to each other or joint can uh, sides of the joint surface can slip relative to each other smoothly. On the other hand, the effect of roughness we implement in phenomenological way by correcting the friction angle or by specifying the, the latency or, or through dilation angle. So here is the illustration of the synthetic rock mass model. So uh, on left side is a cylindrical sample of uh, a, a synthetic model of the rock mass which uh, is uh, using uh, uh, tight packing of spherical particles which are bonded together. And uh, we've done a lot of work, particularly Dave Potiandi, to show that this model actually very well uh, uh, represents behavior, mechanical behavior of, of the brittle rock mass deformation and, and a fracturing. Then <coughs> we can 
introduce in that model uh, the, the fracture network. And fracture network can be represented e either stochastically as a discrete fracture network where we match statistical characterization of the fracturing underground or deterministically where we represent every this, uh, major discontinuity fault with, with its exact geometry. So when we introduce <laughs> those fractures, then what we have is, is a synthetic rock mass or mechanistic model capable of representing uh, the formation and fracturing of the, of the rock mass. So, so what are the advantage, advantages of SRM? So this is completely physics-based model. We correctly represent dominant mechanisms. So very often models based on continuum theory represent the failure of the rock mass as a shearing process. In reality, fractured rock mass doesn't fail by shear. Fracture, failure of the fractured rock mass is combination of sliding opening of pre-existing joints and fracture propagation through the bridges connecting those pre-existing joints. And typically that fracture propagation is uh, driven, driven by, by tension. So if we have correct representation of discrete fracture network, and if we have uh, data on mechanical properties of intact rock and the joints obtained on a small scale laboratory samples, which are the way it, it's typically done, we have mechanistic model that represents behavior of the fracture rock mass and automatically accounts for the scale effect. So we don't need to rely on some ad hoc uh, empirical rules using some GSI factors and, and, and similar. So idea is to use this SRM method to simulate uh, hydraulic fracturing in, in natural fractured reservoirs. However, there is always issue of computational efficiency. So for that reason, we decided to actually use implementation of uh, SRM in a lattice. So what is lattice? So here is the cartoon kind of illustrating lattice in 2D. One thing that's missing here is every node is connected not with one spring, it's actually connected with two springs, normal normal and a shear. So in one sentence, lattice is quasi-random array of nodes connected by springs in, in 3D. So the internal calculation in lattice or bonded particle model is using these micro properties, contact strengths and the stiffnesses which particularly if we upscale the model, don't we don't use it on, as a micro-mechanical model, don't have any particular meaning. So nice thing about lattice and implementation of lattice in this code is that uh, we actually do calibration ahead of time so that when the model is set up, we always operate with typical engineering properties, which is Young's modulus, uh, uh, tensile strength, toughness, and, and, and so on. So this way we are skipping tedious process that people who use, for example, bonded particle models uh, have to do to calibrate these micro properties to match the observed uh, uh, microscopic behavior. So with the use, so the, the, the main uh, computational uh, improvement or the reason why lattice is way faster than uh, standard particle flow model is we assume that uh, everything uh, occurs in a small strain, small displacement, which for hydraulic fracturing is completely reasonable and uh, acceptable uh, assumption. So here is the illustration how the lattice is built, and I use the geometry of the slope, which is not, uh, you know, uh, typical for this model, but just uh, as illustration. So. Basically, what we have is a P brick, which is created by certain packing of uh, 3D spheres. And the P brick has a uh, property that you can uh, replicate it in all three directions. And P bricks uh, perfectly fit uh, to each other. So the 
discretization of the model or model uh, geometry is built very simply and very quickly. We basically multiply p break until we fill the domain that we want to analyze, and then we simply trim whatever lattice uh, gets outside the, uh, outside the domain. Uh, so the calculation in the mechanical model uses explicit solution scheme, and I, most or all Itasca code use this scheme uh, and the main reason is that this approach is well suited for solution of highly nonlinear problems. So we use a central difference <coughs> formula. We, we, we solve the equation of motion for every node. So there are three translational or three, three rotational. Uh, equation is of motion is solved based on distribution of the masses and based on uh, resultant uh, forces and, and the moments. From that we obtain velocities, uh, increments in displacement, we use those uh, to apply uh, in uh, constitutive laws to get the increments of the, of, the, of, the, of the forces. So then new forces again are used to calculate uh, uh, results. And this cycle is repeated until we either reach the target time or our model reaches the uh, equilibrium. So I kind of felt that I need to put some f formulas in my presentation. So this is basically how the, how the entire calculation cycle is implemented. So these are equations used to implement the uh, law of motion. We obtain the velocities, uh, calculate the relative velocities uh, of the nodes associated with particular spring, decompose them in normal and, and, and shear direction, and then then we apply a uh, uh, constitutive law. So assuming that uh, they behave elastically, uh, we calculate the force increment using normal and, and the shear stiffness. However, the springs can fail, and they can fail in a, in a tension or in a shear if the critical uh, force is exceeded and in most of these calculations or models, we assume that the failure is brittle. So what that means is that if spring the breaks, it fails in both uh, tension and shear. After spring breaks, then we keep track of the gap. So basically, fracture can open, but depending on evolution of the loads, pressure, and so on, it can close, close again. If it closes, then and also that applies for the pre-existing joints, the fracture can slip, which is controlled by a, a Coulomb, uh, Coulomb slip law. So, of course, we are solving the uh, coupled hydromechanical processes, injection of the fluid and how in the rock mass and how the rock mass responds to injection of the fluid. So important component of the model is, is, is the flow model. So first question is, what is ge geometrical relation between the flow and mechanical model. So here is the just small detail uh, of, the, of the models that I uh, uh, kind of drew here to kind of illustrate. So let's assume that these are, these are the nodes of the lattice and don't, the nodes are connected by the springs. If as dictated by the forces in the, in the lattice, some of these springs uh, break we basically assume that there is a penny-shaped crack with a diameter equal roughly to the resolution of the, of the lattice. And in the flow model, that crack is like a, acts like a reservoir. So we calculate and control the pressure in these uh, so-called uh, fluid elements. Now, if you have two uh, crack, micro-cracks, which are relatively close to each other, so there is some tolerance, which is function of the resolution, that then kind of uh, defines or tells us that we can actually connect those uh, fluid elements by a, by a pipe. And then the, the pipe is basically element in our flow, flow model where we actually calculate the situation of the, of the pore pressure as a function of the, of the pore pressure field. So, so here is the illustration of a simple model. So it's a, like a cube and there is a penny-shaped crack in the middle, so here on the left side, we have the location of all these micro cracks. 
On the right side is the illustration how these micro cracks are connected by a, by a pipe network. So these, are, these pipes are linear elements. But then we do the same trick as with uh, mechanical model, where this, uh, the lattice network of the spring is made equivalent to continual model with certain you know, mechanical properties. Actually, we calibrate the properties of these, these pipes so that in the end, actually flow through this network of the pipes, if they are planar, is equivalent as the flow between two parallel uh, plates. So, <coughs> so again, we solve the flow in, in such pipe network. The other important thing is that, of course, geometry of the flow model is dynamic. So there are certain pipes that correspond to pre-existing joints, which we generate at the very beginning, but then actually these pipes actually evolve as a, as a result of cracking that uh, you know, develops within a model and automatically the, the network kind of automatically grows. So <coughs> again, we use the explicit finite difference numerical skill, uh, scheme to solve the flow. So the basic formulation is assuming you know, Poisson flow, basically lubrication equation. So, he, so here is the equation for flow rate along, along a pipe. So it's function of the, this, it's a simple thing. So basically there is a pressure gradient, aperture, viscosity. There is a relative probability as a function of, of, of the uh, saturation. And then there is, a, again, a calibration factor that ensures that flow through the network of the pipe is equivalent to the flow between two parallel, parallel plates. And how then, you, how, how does the aperture change with your mechanics? So I'll I'll talk about that. Yeah. So so then, based on these flows, we can calculate for each reservoir location of the of the penny shaped crack. We can calculate uh, unbalanced volume. And then we can actually use this formula using uh, uh, fluid bulk modulus as uh, some kind of relaxation factor to calculate the pore pressure increment in this uh, 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 kind of uh, uh, explicit scheme. So this term here in the kind of in the volume balance equation is basically coupling factor. This is contribution uh, of the deformation or change of the volume of these uh, fluid elements or, or, or reservoirs as a result as a result of uh, uh, deformation. So. <coughs> The, the model, so in, in, to answer Barnes', Barnes question, uh, Randall's question, the, the model is f uh, uh, fully coupled hydromechanically. So what that means is that the, the, as, the, as, the, as the model deforms, the aperture uh, uh, of fracture changes, consequently the permeability of the, of the model changes. The fluid pressure inside the fracture affects the formation, but also uh, affects the strength or the, or the failure of both joints and the, and the intact rock. And then there is this uh, delta V term that I've shown in, in the equation for calculation of pressure increment, which is basically contribution of uh, 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 solid deformation on undrain, uh, to undrain pore pressure changes. So when we set up uh, the such model, well, uh, or when you develop a model like that, the first thing is to kind of validate it, to test it. So here is actually results of the model for a penny-shaped crack for a viscosity-dominated case. So here we are showing the, the pore pressure contours in a penny-shaped crack. We show the displacement vector field. And then here we show the aperture profile as a function of radius at the different times during injection. And we compare the, the solution to the um, uh, M asymptotic developed by uh, Pierce and uh, the Tournay. And we th think that uh, the match is, is uh, reasonably good. So, so this is kind of general description of the, on, in, uh, of the entire model. However, there are some issues that I'm going to discuss a little bit uh, more. So we calibrate the model to match elastic properties and the strength, specifically tensile strength and UCS. The issue with uh, 
this particle model is that if we define the tensile strength of the contact of the springs, then the apparent toughness of that material uh, cannot be set independently. It is then function of the, of the tensile strength, which is calibrated, <coughs> and the particle size. So this is uh, something that Hai Huang, working with uh, Emmanuel, and I think independently, De Podiani and uh, Peter Kandel kind of discovered. So, so what this means is that, so basically the, this term is spring or contact tensile strength. And this is f almost the same thing as a microscopic tensile strength. So what that means is that in these particular models, we can match both tensile strength and toughness only for specific resolution. What is reassuring is when you calculate that resolution, it turns out to be a fraction of centimeters. So that, it kind of, when you take realistic values of toughness and, and tensile strength. So th that means that model is right, because this is what's typical internal length scale of these drugs. However, we would like to use this model not as a, only as a micromechanical model. We would like to use it to solve problems on engineering scale. We would like to solve problems of injection that last for hours on a scale where the fracture lengths are hundreds of meters. So to be able to solve that, we cannot use resolution, which is resolution of the internal length scale, centimeter or fraction centimeter. What we would like to have is a resolution of order of meters or, or, or a greater. So then what happens is that if we use resolution of the order of meters, if we match tensile strength, then our toughness is way overestimated. On the other hand, if we use the fractured toughness, then tensile strength is overestimated. That second option seems to, weigh, seems to be more, way more acceptable because if you are solving simulation of hydraulic fracturing, we really care about matching. What's important is to match toughness. Tensile strength is really not important parameter. So that is what we typically do. However, there are some issues associated or related to that. These grain-based models have another inherent property, and that is that there is a force dis dispersion. And that force dispersion is something why actually we use these grain-based model to study how the brittle rocks fail. So the force dispersion is the reason, for example, if we do UCS tests, even we don't have microscopic tension in a model, there is still a micro tension, which is resulting in what we observe in laboratory tests as a axial splitting. So this is totally physical behavior and response. However, the magnitude of this dispersion is only correct if you also have correct particle size. If we increase the particle size, then the dispersion is way overestimated. And then what we see is that given the, the resolution or particle size, we can have this spurious cracking for all compressive stress state given that there is some component of, of the devi deviatoric stress. So that is creating problems with upscaling, particularly uh, if we then uh, basically scale tensile strength to match toughness. So how, how, do we, how do we deal with that? So all that I discussed about this force dispersion applies to the, this kind of model, which is kind of uh, uh, based on uh, regular uh, packing of the spherical, uh, spherical particles. However, we can create another model with exactly the same arrangement of the particles, but instead of particles, we actually use polygonal blocks, which are sometimes called Voronoi blocks. So difference between this packing and this packing is that with Voronoi blocks, we represent material with zero porosity. The other, the other feature of this uh, packing is that contact area significantly varies. Here, contact area is more or less uniform. With the Voronoi blocks, we have 
quite large uh, distribution in a, in a contact area. But another feature of the Voronoi packing, which is actually very desired, is that actually the <coughs> force dispersion is way smaller. So we basically get rid of this uh, artifact of spurious cracking as a result of the upscaling uh, of, of the lattice. Another feature that I, that I didn't mention of, of, of this uh, pack, uh, packing or arrangement is also that we actually have way more contacts for exactly the same number of the, of the, of the particles. Okay, so one issue that we always deal with these models is, uh, is the runtime. So there are two things affecting runtime. One is model size, basically what kind of, how many uh, node springs we have. And the other one is the, is the critical time step. Now, I mentioned mechanical model and the flow model. So they both have different time steps. However, when we solve these problems, we solve basically quasi-static problems. So real time then comes only from the flow model. So we do mechanical model or recycle mechanical model not to keep it in sync with the time in a flow model. Instead, we do cycling in mechanical model just to make sure that mechanical model is in equilibrium. So that doing that, we can optimize uh, models uh, significantly. So then only thing that we need to worry is the critical time step of the, of the, of the flow model. So there, <clears throat> so I'll, I'm, I'm going to discuss in a little bit more detail some of these terms. So basically mu is viscosity, uh, R is the resolution. So we see very uh, strong effect of resolution on the time step. KF is this uh, is fluid bulk modulus, which is used as a kind of relaxation factor. And then uh, A is the, is the aperture. So some of these factors directly we cannot move because there's a, they, they are model parameters. We have effect on the, on the resolution. So that, that means how good we are with optimization of our, our mesh or grid or lattice. And then uh, aperture is actually solution, a solution of the problem. So we don't have much control there. So, so first thing is the fluid, uh, the effect of the fluid bulk modules. So fluid bulk modules and, and this scheme work well as long as the uh, co contribution of the compressibility of fluid to specific elastic storage, same or greater than contribution of deformability of the rock mass. When the fluid becomes stiffer, this, this scheme becomes extremely inefficient. In the limiting case, you can imagine that when fluid becomes practically incompressible, <coughs> We have a solution where the time scale of the physical problem, meaning elastic storage, diffusivity, are controlled by uh, the formability of the rock mass. On, on the other hand, the time step is controlled by a very, very stiff fluid. So we get extremely inefficient solution. So the, the, the solution would be to determine what is the contribution of the formability of the rock mass to specific storage. That is incredibly complicated and computationally expensive problem. So we can't afford to do that. The reason why we use fluid bulk models is because it's a local, local term. So as many times before and after, Peter came with a new idea or a new scheme to calculate the pressure increment. But that scheme basically boils down to actually approximating the contribution of the deformability of the rock mass to specific storage by uh, bulk modules of the rock mass and the measure of the internal length of the problem. It could be spacing, fracture spacing, fracture length, or to be conservative, it could be just uh, the resolution of that we are using. So it totally makes sense because when the fluid becomes incompressible, the pore pressures are completely controlled by the formability of the, of the rock. <coughs> so the scheme that I described works very nicely and efficiently for viscosity dominated regime. Now, again, there is a, this term which uh, affects the time step. 
which is viscosity divided by aperture square. As this term goes to zero, we again encounter the same situation that we are using viscosity to calculate the dissipation of the pressure within a fracture. On the other hand, our solution in the limiting case doesn't depend on viscosity or the aperture. So basically what is happening is, is this term goes to zero. Our, basically our problem is approaching the toughness dominated regime. And we know that in toughness, when we are in the asymptotic case of toughness dominated case <coughs> regime, <coughs> Basically, there, there's no pole pressure draw. Pole pressure is constant within, within a fracture. So when this happens, then the original scheme becomes in, <coughs> extremely inefficient. So we, what, we, what we do, we ro resolve that, that we switch to what we call simplified logic. We don't even solve the flow within a fracture. Instead, we assume that fracture is uniform throughout the fracture, and then we use a relaxation scheme where we adjust the pressure until the volume of the created fracture is equal to, to injected volume. So we just enforce the continuity or, 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 or volume balance. <coughs> and then finally, a couple of words on uh, effect of the resolution. So <coughs> we saw that the resolution, the time step is proportional to, to to resolution uh, square. However, strictly speaking, we really need find a resolution to around to basically describe the deformation around the fracture tip and to resolve the condition of fracture propagati propagation. On the other hand, whatever fine resolution we determine from that condition, it penalizes our uh, time step in a flow model. And the flow model really doesn't need that fine resolution. So we came with this idea where we use a dual lattice. So there is a sub lattice which is generated only around the tip and which is used only to resolve stresses in the formation around the tip and resolve the condition of the fracture propagation. On the other hand, the deformation on the large scale and the flow are solved in a, in a, in a main coarse lattice. So that way we achieve, achieve the optimum, optimum uh, uh, solution. And sub lattice is generated only locally. It tells us information about the fracture propagation. That information is passed to the main lattice. On the other hand, sub lattice is slaved to the main lattice so that Basic at the boundary, so that the basically displacement and equivalent stress field are, are the same in, in, two, in two lattices. So, he, so here is just a very simple example of how this whole thing works. So there is a, a vertical well, uh, the horizontal penny-shaped crack. So, so here is the illustration of the, of the sub-lattice, so we kind of, again, activate the sub lattice only where we need it around the fracture tip. And next is a kind of illustration of the geometry of the penny-shaped crack uh, calculated using in sub lattice and then equivalent penny-shaped uh, penny crack in the main lattice. So next I'm going to show you uh, a couple of uh, examples. So here is the example of uh, simulation of a single stage it has uh, three injection points or perforation clusters. Uh, they are at uh, 25, 24 meters uh, spacing. We are injecting uh, slick water at 60 barrels per minute for 60 minutes. Important thing is that we solve <coughs> wellbore hydraulics because very important thing to resolve how the fluid, injected fluid, is distributed between three these uh, perforation cluster is a solution of the problem. That's not predefined thing because they are basically they are packed off, and then injected fluid is distributed d depending on the conditions of, of their propagation. So uh, here I show the injection pressure history. So there is a breakdown pressure, and then uh, there is kind of propagation pressure. Here is the geometry of the fractures. In the, in the plan view. So what we see is that there is the effect of interaction of the fractures on, on the trajectory. So those fractures propagated from outside 
uh, uh, injection points are kind of deflected. Clearly, the fractures are not uh, symmetrical. Now, here is the plot of the same geometry, but uh, kind of isometric view with the contours of the of the apertures. But this plot also shows the intera interesting interactions of the fracture in a 3D, meaning that <clears throat> where the fracture appears to overlap in a, in a plane view, what we see is that one fracture propagates downwards and the other fracture propagates upwards. So this is the model where the reservoir height uh, outlined by uh, uh, stress barriers is 150 meters. So what contains the fracture or prevents the growth vertically is basically higher horizontal stresses in the layers above and, and below. So, so the result that I've shown you is this case. So we, do, we did simple sensitivity analysis where we look at the effect of, of the injection point spacing on the, on the geometry of induced fracture. So when we made that spacing half of what is the, in, in the base case, what we see only one fracture goes on the other side, two fractures goes on the other side. When we increase the spacing, it appears that there is a little bit less uh, effect of the fracture interaction on, on, the, on the fracture geometry. This is the same model except that the height, the thickness of the reservoir in instead of 150 meters is, is, is uh, 60 meters. So there is, seems to be stronger effect on the, on the fracture trajectory. But then there is also some kind of interesting effect on basically breakout of these fractures in the layer above and below. And also uh, there is higher uh, injection pressure. Here is the same problem, but I didn't mention in the previous example, the fracture, the well bore is in direction of the minimum principal stress. Now we look at how does the, how do fractures uh, propagate and develop when the borehole is at uh, oblique angle relative to the minimum principal stress at 45 degrees. So what we see that for exactly the same fracture spacing, what in the end appears is that as if we simulated only single fracture. So basically, initially all, all three uh, injection points or clustered in, uh, propagated fracture, but eventually they kind of merge together and effectively it appears as if we have only one fracture. Okay, so here is the example where we use the model to analyze near Valbor uh, uh, fracture initiation. So we are looking here at the initiation of the fracture from the, from the open hole completion segment. The open hole completion segment is roughly uh, one third of the, of the Valbor represented in this, in this model. So in this model, the minimum principle uh, stress is the horizontal along the well bore. An intermediate principal stress is the vertical. Now, injection of the fluid and the pressurization of the open hole actually causes the fracture to initiate in a horizontal plane. However, towards the edges of that open hole segment, that effect of pressure-induced stress concentration kind of disappears. So what we see is that fracture initiates horizontally in a plane of the well bore, but then towards the edges, it, it turns into the direction of the uh, global minimum principal stress. And, and here is the uh, history of the, of the injection pressure. <clears throat> and then finally, uh, this is the example uh, that kind of shows the simulation of the interaction of hydraulic fracture with the pre-existing fracture. So in this case, and which, is, which was simulated by Christine, the minimum principal stress is, is a vertical. So this is penny-shaped crack, uh, which is kind of uh, in this direction. Uh, so we are injecting in this, uh, at this point, uh, and we expect that uh, uh, fracture propagates uh, as a horizontal. Now, during the animation, we kind of turn the viewpoint. So you'll see, so uh, at one point, you'll see the whole model from, from uh, above.
So what we see, the, so the fracture propagates. So its propagation is it's impeded when it hits the pre-existing joint. So typically, if, when you analyze this problem, the 2D question is, is fracture arrested or penetrates through? Now, what we see in 3D, <coughs> neither happens. What happens, fracture is impeded, and then it actually grows around. So then, eventually, it grows completely around. And when you look at it from a side, it appears as it's propagated through the pre-existing fracture. But in reality, it didn't. It actually developed around. So was this clear? Yeah. OK, so we developed new code based on novel methodology. <coughs> the code, as I've shown, can be used for solution of both near and near wellbore and reservoir scale models. Unfortunately, we cannot mix, mix those scale. We can do one scale or the other. We cannot mix them in the same model. Uh, we can do a simulation of realistic field operations. Uh, I, I didn't show multiple wells, we, but we can do that. And we've done many of uh, such models with multiple wells, multiple stages, and the clusters. And uh, <coughs> the model shows examples of uh, complex, interruption, uh, complex interruption of hydraulic fractures propagating within the same uh, stage. And the last example kind of shows that 3D geometry is important for understanding uh, interaction of natural fractures, hydraulic fracture with the, with the natural fractures. that you know, continuum model will be unable to, to track you know, because of what's happening physically in terms of uh, interaction between these continuities. But at the end, you, you are doing simulation and you are using for some realization of these continuities. And presumably, what you are, you obs what you are observing is somewhat insensitive to the particular resolution. So, doesn't that tell you that behind the scene, there's a continuum equivalent? Uh, uh, what you don't know how to, how to do. But if the very fact that you get the same solution, basically, by changing uh, well, well, over configuration would suggest. Yeah, I mean, overall solution may, may, may you know, may be the same, but in, in some kind of average statistical way, but then th how we achieve the solution can involve certain localization that we probably wouldn't be able to completely capture or represent in, in a continuum models. So meaning that in statistical, statistical sense, if I run, let's say, different realization of DFN, uh, you know, I, I, I may, predict the same uh, stimulated volume or area, how, but however, how that uh, volume is achieved or realized may be quite different from one case to another. So, and, and I believe that in that sense, you know, certain discontinuities on a certain scale would be, would be important, you know. So the reason, for example, why geothermal experiments never reach the threshold, you know, what would be the economically viable is that they ended up in uh, basically localization of the flow and deformation. So my, my guess or assumption would be that, well, if you want to analyze this problem, and probably that's not what you want to achieve, that, or, or, you know, that your flow and deformation localize, you know, you still need to have a model that is capable of representing that kind of behavior. And I, I, I totally agree. In terms of, I mean, we need to be extremely smart what discontinuities need to be represented explicitly because there are a wide range of discontinuities 
which are important, but they should be represented in some kind of average sense uh, as uh, by modifying you know, continuum, either mechanical or, or hydraulic properties. Okay, and just on a logical base, I understand that the that details of the, 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 the simulation, which is going to be sensitive to the particular configuration that you are using, but if that is the case and we don't know what the configuration is, then we have a problem. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, no, no, definitely, again, the way these, ideally these models should be used is in, in some kind of statistical sense. I mean, you just can't run re one realization because with one realization, because of uncertainty, uh, spatial variability, we don't know. So in order to really have useful results from these models, you would have to run it multiple times. In some way, capture, you know, as some kind of statistical uh, uh, variable, both input and the result. So. <clears throat> I was intrigued by the uh, issue of fracture toughness versus tensile strength that, that you talked about. I still don't fully understand fracture toughness. Professor Leibniz has tried to explain it to me, and I get confused regularly. Um, but it's not it doesn't seem surprising to me that, that you're going to have a hard time uh, replicating two parameters when you only have one going in. Um, so what about concepts like uh, an, uh, another parameter, for example, uh, making the uh, tensile strength be locally stochastic so you have both a mean and a standard deviation? Uh, I, I don't think what you suggest would work. I mean, there is a way to kind of decouple those two parameters. <clears throat> and that is basically to introduce the process zone. So instead of assuming that the brittles are perfectly brittle, uh, that uh, springs are perfectly brittle, you assume that they are softening. The problem is, if you do that, you actually have to make resolution even smaller than uh, what is the, you know, internal grain size. So you, yes, you have additional freedom, but then it doesn't really solve our problems if we use these models, um, if, if the resolution is upscaled, if the resolution is much greater than the actual grain size, internal length scale of the material. Great, more questions? If not, we will join me. Welcoming Branko back to the department after excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you.